Okay, I just had to, I had to stop that. Uh, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Um, really nice work, Berto, uh, playing that, that flute. Um, I'm so glad everyone's here today. Uh, we are uh, so lucky to have our two guests back for, for this Enigmatology 2 Electric Boogaloo panel. Uh, can't wait to see Berto sign that. Um, we are going to be getting into today the narrative and storytelling elements around puzzles. So yesterday you learned about how to craft a puzzle, the creation of it, the design, the mechanics. Today, we're gonna to talk about the stories that give us that emotional connection, that human connection, or tie us into something in a grander plan. Um, so let me quickly introduce uh, our lovely, lovely guests that you met yesterday, hopefully. Uh, if you haven't also, by the way, in the list, you can watch that video uh, from yesterday in case you missed it. So uh, first we've got uh, certified dream daddy, uh, Gabe Hicks. Um, who is who's presenting the guns today? Do you have a license for those uh, ancient weapons? Uh, I do. I actually got them uh, from the Fey Realm, but it's a you, you got to know somebody. I'm sorry. Okay, well I, that's fine. If you could just give me a hookup, that would be great. Gotcha. Uh, and we've got Jen Kretschmer, uh, my my dungeon master, who has put me through many a trial, um, and also Fey Woodland creature slash Scarlet Witch. Jen apparently, Kretschmer. apparently, the secret to uh, to puzzles is just hang out, hang out in the Feywild for a while. <laughs> exactly, mess with people and have a good time. Um, well, guys, it's a good I, life I'm, strategy. <laughs> I, I feel like you try to employ that in your daily life, which is good. Um, so, I'm excited to get into this panel today. Uh, why don't we Why don't we talk about puzzles? If you've here, here's something I want to just relate back to the Gish community here. Um, if you've ever wondered why, you know, you look at Misha Collins, you're like, why is he like that? The mystery and puzzle that is Misha Collins, well, his backstory would be that sort of storytelling element as to why the puzzle of Misha exists. So uh, I'll, I'll let you guys take it away. I mean, I'm, I'm excited to sort of get into, I, this, is, this is the thing that you guys are both so good at, which is the writing and storytelling and design of that sort of bigger world. Um, how, how does story impact puzzles, I guess is the big question. Um, so like, like puzzles are, everywhere in storytelling and in layers like you don't always expect. Um, it's one thing to just make a puzzle. It's a whole other thing to keep a theme in mind and then build a puzzle around it. Um, recently, I was, in a, I was in a game where there was a puzzle we had to solve and our characters were pirates. So that right there is a theme. And if you were watching the stream yesterday, we talked about semaphore, which is different uh, positions around the circle or like position, like just a clock sort of position to determine letters or ideas or something like that. And when we were playing in our game as pirates, there was a wheel for a ship. We had to rotate that specific directions based off of clues that we were given. And it was, it's the kind of thing that it was like, it fit so perfectly. It was immediate. It was a puzzle that we could easily solve. And well, I say easily loosely, but the wheel of the ship was essentially a combination lock, which when you think about it is another puzzle. Puzzle makers will take like the core premise of a puzzle they want and decide how they want to reskin it to fit the theme. Um, yesterday I talked about Among Us as well. And if you've played it before, there are like wiring cables on the wall. Now, when you think about it, it's just a matching puzzle. You're matching color to color or symbol to symbol, but the way it's themed, you're fixing the wiring on a ship. And it's a puzzle that it just, it's, it feels natural. It feels right. So. A few questions for anyone watching or listening just to think about, what are some themes that you really like for puzzles? Do you really enjoy the fantasy? Do you, do you like enjoy the puzzles of this dragon has a hoard of gold and you have to figure out where it is hidden? Like it's almost a scavenger hunt, a treasure hunt. There's puzzles related to pirates and like thinking about it back, pirates, the way we see it, the way we think about it, like historically or in fantasy, there were dozens and dozens of puzzles. They would hide everything in a puzzle thinking that no one else was going to solve it other than people that felt like them. Yeah, and, I think, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I just Jen, go on. Okay, um, I, I was gonna say, I think often people, um, especially in tabletop games, will find that puzzles are, they stick out if you don't put them in properly. Puzzles need to have a purpose. They need to make sense within the story you're telling. If they are just there for the sake of, hey, let's have a puzzle now. We did an encounter now, let's have a puzzle. Um, 
it's very obvious. And it also detracts from the function of the puzzle. So you really want to approach puzzles when you're using them and when you want to use them um, by thinking about why would they be here? Who would use them? So things like codes, ciphers, those are really great for spy networks because they don't want people to understand them. They are great for um, initiation, for testing new recruits, um, for uh, you know trying to um, make sure someone is qualified or skilled enough to join uh, a secret group. So you think about groups of thieves, you think about something like the Harpers in d and um, These are all groups that are going to want to test you. Um, so puzzles and codes especially are great for testing um, and challenging characters in world for those purposes. Um, they also can be to keep people out. So that's when you get things like locks, um, you know, things to keep people or creatures or items in. Um, so think about why they would be there and what sort of thing would exist in the setting you are creating. So there are, there are testing elements within it to sort of qualify yeah. the people who might be able to solve that puzzle or who might have inside knowledge to something to get inside of the, the solution. Correct. So I, I worked on something called, uh, I worked on a very long, it was a three-year project uh, called the Kansas Collection um, for, for an immersive theater company in LA called, called the Speakeasy Society. I worked with Richard Molina Weber um, and then some members of the Speakeasy Society on this project. Um, it was an adaptation, a 10 chapter, so 10, 10 separate shows about a month, between one and three months apart, I think, um, uh, adapting the later books of Oz. Um, what we did was there was a resistance group in the story. And so in the performances, you could get a code that would, or, or um, a clue that would kick you off onto this pathway that would then lead to testing you on code breaking, testing you on your ability to find um, different pieces of information or parse through different things to make sure you are qualified to be part of the group, but also to communicate information to you secretly. So those are all things to think about um, because that made sense in the world. And everything we did was themed to match the story. It wasn't just, here's a puzzle, here are a bunch of numbers or words or characters for no reason that don't fit. They don't feel like they are part of the world. They don't feel um, like they have grown out of the, the the world that you're working in and playing in. Um, I think just between us, you know, us and a few ten, tens of thousands of people, were you could recruiting for the Illuminati at that point? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, just wanted to check. Great. Mm -hmm. It's just you, between us. You brought up a good point and it's like purpose because what what is the purpose of the puzzle that you're creating? You could literally put a puzzle in a world just to make people feel like they achieved something. Like mm -hmm. if that's your intended purpose and you want to make that the theme of it, even if it's just for you, you make something that's not necessarily too difficult. There's plenty of clues around it and you give them that moment to feel achieved. If you want to yeah. make something that's like actively like, I don't, this, this is just an optional thing, but if they do figure this out, if they figure out the solution, they get a whole big bonus. And then it's a challenge that they feel like they earned and just got something out of it. That sense of accomplishment is part of, is essentially part of the puzzle, really. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Absolutely. Um, I know we also suffer from this because we've sort of habituated our players and gishers to this feeling of everything could be a puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, anytime we put up something nebulous, I, I, I know... Uh, the, the people running that aspect of GISH are uh, delighted by that? Or do you put up false flags sometimes to make people go in wrong directions? So I think one of the elements of good puzzle design um, when you're really getting into kind of puzzle design theory is you want people to know when they are doing a puzzle or when there are puzzles available. I mean, it's always fun to, to spontaneously discover one um, just because it happens to be there. But really you want people to know that something is there so they start looking for it. Um, and you also want people to know when they are making progress and, and achieving it. So I think really 
it's it's really important as you create puzzles and you begin to design your own to think about how you're going to clue people that this puzzle exists um, and sort of put them on the right track, whether that's using language or images or textures or smells or tastes in your setup for the puzzle and your clues that surround it, or whether it is um, having a, a quest giver type person. Um, you really want, uh, unless you're already in an established place where people are anticipating those things, where they expect that everything is going to be a clue, is going to be a puzzle, um, and are looking for them, you really need to, to help steer those expectations. Um, I also think it's really important, again, to reinforce something we talked about yesterday, which is that puzzles are kind of inherently ableist, um, and you want to think about having multiple ways of solving them, and potentially also talking about what skills are going to be required for those, those puzzles um, so that people can decide if that's something they're wanting to, to play with or not. Um, but also I think with puzzles, particularly when you're putting out puzzles that are being done by a lot of people, um, so if you're varied, talking about something- Varied skill sets and things, varied backgrounds and, and yeah. understanding for sure. Absolutely. And there's always, you know, cultural references and language references um, that are, are come out of, of lived experience. And um, yeah. well, um, it's interesting too, because definitely, and you made a good point in our first panel that there's inherent ableism within the access to the puzzle, the solution, the mm -hmm. skills to solve it, things like that. Laura actually asked a sort of corollary uh, question, which is, there are some benefits too for people uh, facing some, some neuro challenges. So she says, uh, I still have some chemo brain, so my cognitive skills are a bit diminished. My oncologist suggested I do puzzles. I can't stand Sudoku, but what other puzzles do you suggest to build cognitive responses that are fun? Because she needs that for her, for her uh, rehabilitation and her uh, physical uh, treatment. Well, the, yeah. The one I talk about is, is I love riddles because the solution of a riddle can be different than what the intended idea was. And if it gets you thinking about the different options and it gets you like, well, you know what? I, like it could be this thing. And, and you get to those notions. If you're looking through riddles and just trying to think and just come up with the ideas, there's nothing wrong with having multiple ideas or solutions as to what that answer could be. I feel like that's even better because you can ask someone else the riddle and then change the answer, to be honest. Some, 30 people could ask the same riddle to each other and all could have a different solution. Yeah, I think word puzzles are, are great. Um, and if you like crosswords, you know, there have been a, a bunch of uh, studies showing crosswords decrease, decrease your risk of Alzheimer's and increase your, um, those, those neural pathways that we're talking about. But also I, I think games like The Room, which you can get for, for uh, on your mobile device. Um, and there are, three or four of them now, um, it's, a, it's a puzzle box. And so it's fun to have a storyline that you're following. Um, the design on the game is really good. Um, the puzzles are really varied. So I think that's a really fun one. That's awesome. um, the room, that's the, the, uh, room. the room, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I believe it's by Atlas Games, but I may be making a mistake on that. Um, but I, I wanted to bring up one other thing, Charlie, that you made me think of, which is when you're doing puzzle design for a large group of people, um, it's almost always better to skew difficulty toward the easier side of things. Um, you want people to have fun with puzzles. Um, when it becomes so difficult that all people are doing is getting frustrated, what happens is people kind of just throw in the towel and walk away and then go either look on the internet for a solution, you know, or or give up and so you really want to it's better to have people finding that they can get through these checkpoints in the puzzle and feeling like they are achieving something yeah. um you want people to see the work you've done and if if you've made it so difficult that no one's going to be able to solve it if you've done so many complications and iterations that people won't find i mean things. hours grinding on mist even though i love the game like there were moments when i just wanted to throw in the towel and it makes you i mean it, there's a sense of defeatism and i think you know it's it's more of a trap than a puzzle at that point right it's mm -hmm. 
uh, it's, and we, I think it also reflects a little bit the, and we've, we've faced this with Gesh too. I mean, this, these two, your two panel, quite honestly, are a great learning for us. It's something that we wanted to see. And then we realized, wow, we're going to be giving away some of these sort of techniques and, yeah. you know, sort of open sourcing this a little bit more. Um, there is a puzzle we added uh, late last night to the hunt list um, that again, based on what you guys talked, what you folks talked about yesterday, there are, you gave them the keys to it. And all you have to do is be willing to look for the clues, do a little bit of like education, and then you're off to the races. Yeah. One of my favorite things is when I give a puzzle, give them half of the solution already. Like if there's four steps, give them the first two steps done, because then they go back and figure out why it's right. It, it's giving them like almost a glossary without giving them all the answers. It's like, okay, well, I know how these ones, these ones make sense because they're right. How do I make these other two fit? And you can you can make that as long as you want to, or like even when storytelling, I had I was running a game, they got through the first two pieces of the puzzle and had no idea they were in a puzzle until I wanted them to know halfway through. So then they went back, they looked at everything, they looked at how it was shifted, and the excitement in their eyes of like, everything is a puzzle piece now. I was like, oh my God, I'm just gonna sit and watch. Well, Charlie, I did that to, to all of you. All of the handouts you were all getting for months had black light writing on them, and you had no idea until you got this key that started unlocking that. Okay, that's um, true. one of us is yeah. terrifying. I'm just, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, just person watching the show. Jen is ringleader, is what I. Y yes, yes. She, I mean, she put us through a long con of like, it's uh, been there. It was like, uh, it was, it was like usual suspects level like oh my what like i see dead people several times it was uh, if you know. she dms your game just be ready <laughs> lovely um uh, it, it's it's really i just totally lost my train of thought because that's i was busy doing the no stop complimenting me i know no no more of this um, um well we can also just uh to the audience here um i want to oh. extend if you have uh any questions about adding story to puzzle narrative building ways in which you can add narrative elements to directly tie back into puzzle making raise your hand we'll bring you on we'll uh get some questions answered i know we also got the q a going um i thought was... of uh, what it was yes. charlie we're talking about dnd &D. um with puzzles one of the best assets you have is is a group so a group of people bring a whole bunch of different skill sets um knowledge different things that they will spot or find um, because everyone's brain works differently and everyone's body works differently. So people will have different skill sets to bring to the table when you have a puzzle. Someone might be really good at three-dimensional work and be able to visualize something, you know, you know, converting a flat image to a cube. I've had to do cube crosswords before as a puzzle. Yeah. Um, someone might be really good at, um, seeing a word and going, oh, that sounds like this out loud. And it, it, they've abstracted the meaning by scrambling it. You know, someone might be really good with numbers. Having a team, this is the reason puzzle hunts are all team-based. Yeah. It, it's it's such an that's asset. The, that's the advocacy too. Rather than diversity for diversity's sake, diversity meaningfully enriches your ability to solve problems, understand the backgrounds of things, different points of view, you know, and we've been talking about this with Gish for a long time, being made up of a, a team from different countries, different backgrounds, different dialects. These things, if you learn how to navigate and are, are willing to be a global citizen, actually meaningfully help you understand other cultural things, but also break down puzzles and challenges in ways that you don't have the tools for. Uh, that's a really good point. Using language, reading music, understanding different codes or terms. It's all, it's all something that having partners on that process is, is it's only going to help. Gosh, I see more 100%. questions coming in. Yeah, lots more questions. And I see uh, we've got a few hand raises too. Let's, um, I'm going to grab a couple people here and we'll just start answering some questions about story within puzzles. Um, uh, what, what about, do you guys, do you folks have any favorite puzzles of all time? Are there any other like puzzles to, to point people to that you would also, that could be sort of meaningful to teach them about story within puzzle or, you know, something sort of example based? I, I there was, it was something I did a while back. It was like an ad lib puzzle. 
Uh, so it, like, it was, it was an open-ended problem that you could solve, but putting in things that were matching a theme. Uh, and if it like was a matching word or something from a poem or a name of a person that you met in the story before, then it like actually accepted it. It was it was filling in an ad lib that was that already had answers to it. It's awesome. Uh, Selena's with us. Hi, Selena. Good to Hi, see Selena. you. Hi, nice to see you guys. Oh, this is yeah. so exciting for me. Um, I'm an old. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the term ARG or alternate reality game. Yes. Um. Yeah. I got introduced to this uh, through a movie, the uh, AI, mm -hmm. and the alternate reality game associated with that called The Beast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, AI had a hidden, in their movie poster, had a hidden uh, code, which if you could find that, you it led you to a website, which led you down a rabbit hole. Right. Um, ARGs yeah, take you into the real world to explore and do a, a real world scavenger hunt. Yeah, and it was, it was a lot of fun. They updated every Tuesday. And, uh, and so it was like update Tuesday and we'd all just freak out and, and do stuff. And it was super great. And, and uh, have you guys had any experience with doing those kinds of games? Yeah, yeah. My, my mother absolutely loves them. Like she found out before I did and she's like, Gabe, we need to do this. I'm like, what do we, she's like, just, 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 just come with me. And like, what, we would do it for like months and months. Like it would be the thing that I would just go spend time with her and that would just be how we hung out. And then we'd get lunch, one of my favorite things. That's awesome. That's cool. Yeah, yeah I, ARG is amazing. I mean, there's a lot of movies and TV have done it. Nine Inch Nails actually did a whole long form version of that. That was really cool. They did. Year Zero was amazing. It was so much fun to play. And I, yeah. I kind of miss them. You don't see them nearly as much anymore. Yeah, yeah they're difficult to do. And from the, pr the production side, from the TV side, which is kind of the world I work in, a lot of the time it, it can have a reduced um value for the department that it it that puts them on because they're very complex and so on and so forth it's, wandavision it's a, had a bunch of know. uh embedded codes though if you watch wandavision carefully they have a bunch of embedded uh hidden codes there's some semaphore and clocks and video oh cassettes gosh. and things um, yeah. Oh, I went, I went wild with it, but, um, but <laughs> I, I actually, a lot of the, the projects that I'm developing have, uh, an immersive or real world world component. That's something I'm very interested in, in terms Amazing. of the work I'm developing. I'm really looking forward to seeing those. Thanks. Thank you, Selena. Thank you. Good to see you Bye. again. Lily, Lily, you've got a question. Yeah, uh, I do. Um, like, so I play D and D with my older sister, and I'm thinking about DMing some games, but I'm kind of new to it. So, like, do you have any advice? It if if you're having fun and everyone else is having fun, be confident that even if your puzzles don't feel as complicated as some other people's, if they don't feel as long drawn out, if you're having fun, that's more than enough. Like one of, one of the most satisfying things of a, a puzzle ending is like, ha, we got it. And if, it, if they come up with this random answer that they're super excited about, and you're like, I don't know how to lead them to the answer, you can just fake it. They'll never know. <laughs> well, and, That's a good point. You never, I mean, has Jen ever done that to any of us, maybe? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Many times. Um, but but what, what I think also a lot of people don't talk about, but it's really is important for, for DMs is we all steal stuff. If you see something or look for, for puzzles that people have used, feel free to take those and use them in your own game. Um, unless you're doing a streamed game where, where people are watching. Um, if you're playing at home just with your friends and family, use whatever you want. There's, there's so much material out there. Um, or, or take something you like and reskin it for your game. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable with puzzles yet, um, the book Tasha's Guide to Everything that came out uh, this year or last year um, has a whole section on puzzles, but also you don't have to put puzzles in right away until you feel a little more comfortable as a DM. That's no one, no one insists on it. Plenty of games don't have them at all. So it, it's up to you and your group what you want to put in, but it's fantastic that you want to DM. I think that's, it's the best thing. Like it's so much fun and right. you're going to have a great time. So. Unless you play with us, in which case it's a terrible time. We're obnoxious. We are very impulsive. We never have a cleric. It's great. Um, oh. Thank you, Lily. And yeah, we'll um, we'll be posting resources and whatnot too uh, for some of those things as well. Um, 
there's a question here from Adam um, for you, Gabe. Uh, you mentioned giving two steps out of four. Could you give us an example of a puzzle in action briefly? Um, also, uh, I loved the Gish Key puzzle a couple of years ago. Awesome, awesome, Adam. Absolutely. Uh, so so if, if, if anyone has ever played uh, Elder Scrolls, um, in Elder Scrolls Skyrim, there are caves where you need to put certain symbols before you put in like a talon or a claw into a wall. And there were some dungeons where you would enter and the first one was already done. They were already arranged in the right spot. You just had to press the button. Then you would get to the next room you try to press the button, it doesn't open this time. Why doesn't it open? You can go back to the first room, notice there's symbols around. There's the bird, the bear, and the snake. And it's bird, bear, snake on the door. You go to the next room, you see a uh, bird, whale, snake. But the door is iguana, cow, mouse. And you're, it's, it's that moment of like, oh, they all matched on the first one. Okay, I just have to go into the second one, switch it around. So like, even if they don't necessarily realize if, if they walk through a door that was already unlocked and then they notice like there's something that unlocked the door or they walk through a room and realize all of the pressure pads, like there's already some things that are pressed. Maybe we have to mimic that in this next one. Give them a situation where like the first part of a puzzle is done and that can be their entire reference for how to do the second part. Awesome, love it. I mean, people are, there's a lot of questions here and I know we're running out of time. Um, I know there's one thing too within that sort of ableism sort of ability slash age or mature, maturity. Um, I'm seeing here that there's a question about my D&D game has a player who is there for story and a player who is really only into mechanics. They are 13 and nine respectively. I'd like to design puzzles they can collaborate on any hints. I think this is a great question also just in terms of thinking about audience and story together. How do you, yes. how do you how do you folks sort of approach that? Um, so for something like that, I would absolutely try and think of a puzzle that allows them both to to use the things they enjoy at the same time. So I might design a combat situation where the player who loves mechanics can fend off the enemies as they're approaching, while the player who really enjoys puzzles solves on their turn, they get to work on the puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, also, I would say when you're playing a tabletop role-playing game, unless you are making the, the player who is playing the barbarian bench press 400 pounds, um, you should not ever make a character who has a high intelligence st uh, stat score um, have to solve as a person, not their character, a puzzle without help. Um, if you have a high intelligence character, you should be able to provide clues to help them solve it. Um, if they can solve it on their own, great, but it's the same with, with bards and charisma. Like You should not expect that your player who is playing a bard is going to be charismatic all the time, even though their character is. Um, and I think a lot of DMs expect that to be role play, but it, it's not fair to the players who play those characters um, a lot of the time. But yeah, that's, I think that would be how I would go about it. I would try and design something where there are enemies coming in and, and there is a, a place that the mechanics based character can fight or be doing something with the mechanics they enjoy while the other player who enjoys puzzles is solving a puzzle or try and find a way to uh, create short puzzles that allow them to work together to solve. Amazing, and this dovetails right into the challenge. Is there anything else uh, y'all wanna talk about in terms of story before we go to the Gish hunt list item here? If, if you're making a story for people, did happily consider the things that they like, or even ask them. Ask them what sort of stuff they like in a story, and then you can build off of that. Because if you know what they like and you know what you like, you can put those together so then everyone like involved is happy. You can build a story for you and other people at the same time. Yeah, I ask about um, what they enjoy in terms of level of difficulty, um, frustration level, if they like timed, like time pressure um, puzzles. And also if you ever are giving a timed puzzle, you need to give your players advanced warning and you need to take a break right beforehand. Um, those are just basic access issues. Um, run it by people. Um, I've seen it go so badly that it uh, actually ended a campaign, like a several year campaign ended because of a, a situation that became a time puzzle without warning that was testing skills that people weren't comfortable 
um, using and when they said we're not having fun, the DM didn't listen. So um, really communication is always the baseline here. Um, talk talk well, to your players, think about your audience who you're designing for. Um, and if you're designing on a broad scale, like for a game, like a video game or for some sort of um, adventure system that, that where you don't know your audience, think about ways to have a kind of a sliding scale of difficulty, ways to increase the difficulty and decrease um, maybe hints that you can give, or um, if you have players who love puzzles, here's where they start versus if you have players who aren't huge puzzle fans, here's where they start. And here are other ways to get around this if, you, if they don't want to, to try. Well, that's that's a perfect lead into our challenge for uh, the Gish hunt list here. Um, I'm gonna just share that right now. Just one second while I do 17 things at once. Um, so with that in mind, whether you have a person who's very into puzzles or very into story, you know, those two entry points, uh, it's an image. As we all know, Gish is a magical secret society and we're recruiting new members. Luckily, you now have the skills to invite a friend, create an invitation that will direct a friend who is not a Gisher to this URL, this website link, gish.com forward slash enigmatology. The website password is death to normalcy. Uh, all one word, all together with caps on the D and the N. Encode it in the invitation. Submit an image of yourself as a magical secret society member with your invitation. This is 36 points. Um, and uh, thank you so much, y'all. I mean, this is, uh, <laughs> puzzles are one of those things that I think to the outside community can seem daunting and inaccessible. It's only for the smart people or whatever the bias is. But the more we can open up this access, the more we can open up story and mechanics to people, I think the more fun we can have, especially during quarantine where we're stuck in single spaces potentially. It gives us, it gives our mind that random thought or that sort of interactivity that we may be missing in our lives. So uh, yeah. thank you all so much. And if, if people want to learn more, um, Dave and I are going to be teaching a course on puzzles on Twitch coming up. Um, follow us on socials for information on when and where and so on and so forth. Yep. It's going to be yes. Let me, uh, let me put up those, uh, let me put up those socials real quick. Yes. We've got uh, follow everybody, follow people on here, especially on Twitch. If you're not a Twitch user, you can still, watch first of all and uh and check it out because uh they're a uh, wealth of knowledge coming up next 12 p.m pacific we've got chandlery as i like to call it chandlery uh with cantrip with uh, uh christoph fisher of uh, cantrip candles we're really excited about this one uh christoph has done some amazing work in this space and whether you know how to make candles or don't or just you're a sort of Amateur candle user, you're gonna enjoy this panel because there's a lot of uh, a lot of fun storytelling here. Even if you're just a candle keeper, a candle keeper, yeah, in candle keep with candles. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you so Go much. Go back to the Fey Wild. Go back to the the, <laughs> the gun show that you're a part of. Dream Daddy. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Shameless. Hi everyone. Thanks everybody.